grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. And welcome to this service of morning prayer for this third Sunday after the Epiphany. A special and warm welcome to those of you who are joining us over Zoom and on Facebook. We know that in the last several weeks, uh, our sound has been challenging for those of you who worship with us from a distance. Uh, we believe we've fixed it for this week. So if you're having sound challenges, please text someone and let us know, and we'll try and sort it out for next week. Everything you need is hopefully found in your bulletin. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him. seated for our readings. Good morning. Let us read Psalm 19 responsibly by verse. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous together. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins, let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Glory, Glory to, to the Father, Father, and the Son, and, Son, and the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 
A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with great honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together and with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all a prophet? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but strive for the greater gifts? The word of the Lord.
reading from the Gospel according to Luke. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on Sabbath day, as it was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the places where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight of the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the Lord to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. Then they began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The word of the Lord. Between the words that are spoken and the words that are heard, may the Spirit of God be present. Amen. Please be seated. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? And the people respond, I will with God's help. This is the second promise of the rite of baptism that we use in the Episcopal Church. You can find it in your Book of Common Prayer if you want to look along on page 304. The Book of Common Prayer is the black one. Gideon two weeks ago began talking about the baptismal promises that we make when we baptize in the Episcopal Church. The promises that are made on behalf of children too young to make them and that are made by people who are grown and are able to make their own promises. In the Book of Common Prayer, there are five baptismal promises, and this one is the second. These five promises come after we say together the Nicene Creed, joining together and uh, proclaiming our faith. They come before the Nicene Creed, after the Nicene Creed, but before the water is poured on the person in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. These five promises, I think, are something of a summary of the life of faith that we choose to live as Christians when we are baptized. This question, this second question, will you persevere in resisting evil and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? It's a bit of a doozy, I think. Resisting evil? Who talks like that? Sin. Oof. Repentance. Even worse. These promises, this promise, in some ways seems to suggest that there might be something about us that needs to change. It's a little rude, right? Perfect, just as I am. This is stuff that we normally save for John the Baptist, for Advent, for this idea of a season of coming. Or maybe it's the stuff of fairy tales and movies. I think that, however, resisting evil and repentance are more common in our lives than we think. And I actually believe that they are central to the Christian life. We can see these themes of repentance and return through our readings this morning. In the reading to the church in Corinth from the first letter of Paul, Paul is writing about a specific problem. In fact, Paul is almost always writing about a specific problem. Last week, if you were here, you might have heard Paul enjoining the Corinthians not to rank certain spiritual gifts above other spiritual gifts. You know, they were Greek. They lived in Corinth in a city dedicated to the Greek god Asclepius. 
and they understood that gifts came from different gods. And maybe because they came from better gods, they might be better. But Paul is telling the church in Corinth, no, these gifts all come from the Holy Spirit, and they are all equally important and valid. And today he moves on to the analogy of the body, saying that all of these gifts are part of the body. The evil that Paul is trying to counter in the community is a question of hierarchy and division. One of ranking certain members above other members. The repentance that he calls for is a recognition that the Holy Spirit is the source of all of our gifts. And, a, and, a, the, and he calls for an honoring of all of these parts. In Greek, the word that we use for repentance that is echoed in our baptismal promise is metanoia. And in Greek, that word means something more than just repentance. It means a turning, a turning away from evil and towards God. There were many, many controversies happening in the church in Corinth. This one about the Holy Spirit was only one of them. But in all of these controversies, Paul calls the church in Corinth to turn away from separation and towards community. We see these sorts of divisions in our own time, too. Maybe not arguments about the Holy Spirit necessarily, but certainly controversies that divide communities. Political divisions, racial divisions, social and economic divisions, even divisions within families over these issues or over completely different ones. Divisions over how inheritance is to be split or how a house is to be broken up. Paul invites the more powerful members of the church in Corinth not to scorn the weak, but rather to honor them even more. In writing to the people in the church of Corinth, he calls them to turn away from self-interest and pride and to turn towards God and neighbor. Repent and return. This call for repentance and return is also central to Jesus' message, and we see it in our gospel this morning. I want you to picture this for a second. Imagine yourself in St. John's Church on a Sunday morning. A man who grew up in the church returns home to Cold Spring Harbor or Huntington or Laurel Hollow, and on Sunday he goes to church as was his custom. But in the middle of the service, he marches up to the lectern and he opens the Bible to Isaiah. That's not in the bulletin. And the passage that he chooses is this one that we heard. It goes like this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To let the, the, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Might be a little bit surprising, right? This, however, is the same message that Paul would echo later. The one, one that moves those who are at the center of the society to the outside and moves those that are at the margins to the center. Good news for the poor. Prisoners are released. Those without sight can see. The oppressed are made free. What Jesus reads in Isaiah describes the ultimate leveling, one in which evil is defeated, one in which sin is erased, and one of repentance and return to God. This may seem a little bit like the stuff of fairy tales and movies, however. Maybe some of you have seen the latest Disney craze, the Disney movie Encanto. If you have not seen it once or seven times, or have heard people talking about it, I'm gonna give you the briefest of summaries. The movie Encanto deals, addresses a controversy within the Madrigal family. The Madrigal family is one that has been blessed by gifts. Maybe not spiritual gifts as described in the church in Corinth, but magical gifts. 
But the community of the Madrigal family has become divided over a sense of ranking some gifts over other gifts. Some family members leave, some family members aren't seen to have gifts at all. And this disturbance in the community causes a crisis. There's also, as in the Gospel according to Luke, a prophetic word from the past which disturbs the peace. In this movie, the powerless are lifted up and become the cornerstone of a new future. Repentance and a return to community are central to saving the family. In church, we may sort of recoil from this idea of repentance and return because it sounds harsh, but these are in fact the stories that we tell ourselves in the world as well. But they're not only stories. Every week here at St. John's Church in Bleecker Hall and in the church, no, I don't, whatever the conference room is called, Every week, men and women meet for AA on Tuesdays and Fridays. AA is a program that calls for repentance and return, that asks people to examine their own lives and say, I can do better for myself and for my community. On Sundays, when we do Eucharist here at St. John's Church as well, we pray a prayer of confession, a prayer that asks forgiveness for the things that we have done in our lives and the things that we have left undone. Indeed, many of you who grew up Catholic are probably more used to it, but in the Episcopal Church, we also have a rite of reconciliation. Once again, you can find it in your prayer book on page 447. The rite of reconciliation is an opportunity for someone who wants to make a special act of repentance and repair to come and sit with a trusted member of the community and pray for forgiveness. This act of repentance and repair is central to what it means to be a person of faith. Sounds like hard work though, right? The good news, however, for us as Christians is that in Jesus, we don't have to do this alone. Christ accompanies us on our journey back to God and community. In fact, Jesus says that very same thing today in this morning's gospel. As he sat down, he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The leveling, the repentance, the return, the return to community is fulfilled in Christ. And all we need is the desire to turn and return, and we will find that God is in fact already present. When we are baptized, we die with Christ, and we are raised with him to new life. Looking at your own life, I wonder, where is God bringing this new life into being? Where is God calling you? I wonder, where in your life could you follow Christ more fully and allow that new life, that repentance and return to transform you? Where might you repent and return? With the help of God Almighty, who loves you just as you are, but also loves you too much to let you stay that way. Amen. are able, please, to stand and affirm your faith with me, using the words of the Nicene Creed, saying together, we believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made.
For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I ask your prayers for our parish family. Almighty and most merciful God, we remember before you all poor and neglected persons whom it would be easy for us to forget, the homeless and the destitute, the old and the sick, and all who have none to care for them. Help us to heal those who are broken in body or spirit and to turn their sorrow into joy. Grant this, Father, for the love of your Son, who for our sake became poor, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And I ask your prayers for all those who are sick and all those who are commended to our prayers. God of compassion, be close to those who are ill, afraid, or in isolation, particularly our armed forces and those who serve our nation overseas. For the victims of the tsunami and volcano eruption in Tonga, and those who are ill, Eileen Bellini, Aster Chang, Chloe Clancy, Suzanne Kremens, Elisa Dean, Luke Demarest, Lisa Evans, Nancy Fowler, Barbara Gallagher, Bob Gonzale, Vanessa Gullo, George Harstead, Evelyn Hiller, Edith Hoffman, Marie Lee, Ruth Knudsen, John Lamatola, Michael Manzalillo, Virginia Martinez, Alan Moore, Peter Morris, Peter Puelco, Jarrett Pagano, Joan Penrose Borum, Raphael Roper, Jack Santaniello, Joan Small, 
Donna Lee Wieland, Connie, and any others we name now aloud or in our hearts. In their loneliness be their consolation. In their anxiety be their hope. In their darkness be their light. Through him who suffered alone on the cross but reigns with you in glory, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I ask your prayers for all those who have died. May all the departed through the mercy of God rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. And we say together the general thanksgiving, saying, We give you thanks, most gracious God, for the beauty of earth and sky and sea, for the richness of mountains, plains, and rivers, for the songs of birds and the loveliness of flowers. We praise you for these good gifts and pray that we may safeguard them for our posterity. Grant that we may continue to grow in our grateful enjoyment of your abundant creation, to the honor and glory of your name, now and forever. O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Just a, a couple of announcements uh, for the good of the community. First, a warm welcome to you all on this beautiful Sunday. It's great to have you with us. Um, just a, an announcement that this coming week on Wednesday, we continue our study of Samuel's wonderful book, How Then Shall We Live? Last week, we had a wonderful and very dear and sensitive conversation around bereavement. And this week, we'll continue our study of the book, reading together the chapters on chronic illness and disappointment. Many of us, uh, if, if we're lucky, will not suffer from chronic illness for too long, uh, but many of us will find disappointment in our lives. We invite you to join us on Wednesday to look at these issues in the light of the good news of Jesus Christ and to help us think with new ways of, of how we live with these um, moments in our lives of disappointment and also chronic illness. The, so, the study begins um, at 8 p.m. There is a 15-minute period of centering prayer that begins at 7.45 the whole study is, uh, has been and is, continues to be on Zoom, and the details for how to join are both on our website, in our calendar, and also uh, in the at St. John. So we would hope to see some of you there for that. Additionally, next week is uh, another uh, banner week in the life of St. John's, when we will get the chance to welcome to St. John's the Reverend Dr. Matthew Moore. Matthew is a professor at Brooklyn College, an ordained Episcopal priest, and the diocesan missioner for uh, environmental justice and cre creation care. Uh, he's also the co-chair of the diocesan creation care community, the other co-chair of which is, standing on my left, the Reverend Mary Beth Mills Curran. So Matthew joins us uh, to think with us about our invitation by God to care for creation. As you all know, we have identified over the last several years five core sort of focuses of our life at St. John's, one of which is stewarding the creation that has been placed in our care. For us, those gifts are the incredible gifts of this beautiful pond uh, on which this church sits and that we own, the grounds and forest behind the church, which we also own, the six acres of the harbor, the innermost acres of, Saint, of Cold Spring Harbor, which we also own, all of which is a very rich and sensitive ecosystem uh, and our decisions make a huge impact um, on this parcel of ours, but also this parcel helps us to see uh, the ways in which we can care for the whole of God's creation. So consider uh, joining us either in person or over Zoom to welcome Matthew to St. John's next week. I also know that next week is uh, the opportunity for young people, grades 6 through 12, to be trained as acolytes. Do you want to say more about that? Yes. Um, is your mic on? I don't know. Yeah, 
Yeah, it is. Um, next week, we are um, going to be having a training for folks that want to be part of our acolytes. If you have uh, someone in your life who is in 6th through 12th grade and wishes to join, you can come and be trained after church. Um, if you were an acolyte before, and uh, we also encourage you to come because we're kind of relaunching, getting a sort of brush up on what is going on. Um, if you're younger and are especially keen, you are also welcome to come and learn about being an acolyte and see if you might be able to do the acolyte tasks. So it's not really an age limit. It's just if you're able to do what an acolyte Principally, that's carry the cross, carry which is actually quite heavy. So, you know, we had this conversation about why do we make it sixth graders? Like, well, wait a minute. Maybe a fifth grader can, maybe they can't carry the cross. Who, but if you'd like to find out, come join us next week. Come join us next week. And we'll give you a chance. Um, the other thing that I wanted to make a brief announcement of is that we are starting, we've had sort of a soft launch of a, um, a program for grades third through sixth at the, during the nine o'clock hour. So if you are interested in that uh, before church sort of Sunday school thing, come talk to me. And that group is called? I wasn't gonna say that. Oh, you're not gonna say it? No. You don't wanna tell them, it's a secret. It's a secret. All right, don't tell them. We won't tell you what it's called. <laughs> but um, it is our Sunday school offering for that older group. Yeah. And it's before church because that's when it is. So consider joining us for that. All right. I think that's everything. Ascribe the Lord. Oh, no, it's not everything. Okay, surprise. Good morning. Um, on March 27th, we will attempt to present the Lenten musical Tale of the Three Trees. Now, with uh, COVID in mind, of course, uh, children not fully vaccinated, most of uh, some of them. Um, I, I struggled with this idea, but I thought, you know what, why not? Let's give it a shot and let's see how the uh, children rises to the occasion. So for the children five and above who are vaccinated, the rehearsals for the musicals will commence on February 6th, that's Sunday after the church service, 10, 10, 10 a.m. church service. More details will be offered on the St. John's newsletter this Thursday. So I welcome all and all to join in this Fantastic musical. Thank you. Did you I'm was trying to listen. Did you say the upper age limit? Is there an upper age limit? Uh, no. All right. There isn't. Great. So, Billy, dust off your tap shoes. No. Uh, but I think it's intended for youth, right? That's correct. Right. Okay. So, if you consider yourself young or young at heart, join us for Tale of the Three Trees. Thanks, June. Ascribe the Lord the honor due God's name. Bring offerings and come into his courts with praise.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Before we sing our closing hymn, just a note that in the preparation of the bulletin, there was a mistake. So if you look at the back page, the top two lines are flipped. So the easiest thing to do if you want to sing it correctly is to open your hymnal to hymn number 522 and join with us in this last song, our last hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. <laughs> 